I'm really, really excited to have uh, Dr. Luis uh, Chasson Baxter uh, here with us today uh, because uh, Dr. Um, Luis has uh, uh, an uh, uh, amazing specialty that is called non-invasive uh, uh, reconstructive care, which means that uh, to a number of uh, uh, back problems uh, that traditionally would require uh, surgery uh, can be cured or can be helped without the surgery. So which is, uh, you know, you, you can save a lot of pain, a lot of uh, expenses and uh, costs and, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of problems. So now Dr. Luis is, uh, is based in uh, London, England, and uh, she's uh, the director of uh, the, uh, the Health Lodge. Um, and specialize in um, uh, in the uh, yeah non-invasive non, non, non uh, reconstructive care. So, uh, without much ado, let's uh, uh, listen to what uh, Dr. Luis has to say. So, Dr. Luis, um, could you please uh, give us a little more information about you, what you do, and how this the whole thing is started with you? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So I'm, I am a doctor of chiropractic. I'm here in London. I've been here for over 22 years. Um, and we practice um, non-surgical reconstructive care, uh, which is uh, a mixture of chiropractic and another technique called chiropractic biophysics. And so what we do is we do body treatment, we do exercises, we do physiotherapy, but we also use non-surgical traction procedures to actually reshape and remodel spines and conditions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, it's quite exciting because we do get changes that we can measure. So we can actually take an x-ray at the beginning of care and one at the end of care. And not only are we seeing symptomatic improvement, but we're actually seeing structural improvement, which means mm -hmm. On the inside, things are changing, moving back to the normal position that they should be, and we can stabilize that in the right place, which means we're not just looking after the pain, we're looking after the problem that's causing the pain in the first place. Mm -hmm. Addressing the root cause. Um, so um, how, how, did, how did you uh, get, what is your personal story about uh, how you got into this, uh, you know, the spinal health care, and uh, this is a very important field but uh, you have tons of options, I'm sure. So absolutely. what's your question? Yeah. yeah absolutely. So my mom um, was uh, very, my mom was a nurse and she was very much into geriatric care when wow. I was younger. So I would go and visit her at the hospital working in elderly care and patient, uh, just elderly care centers uh, throughout most of her, her career. And so for me, I got quite an affinity towards uh, the elderly. And uh, being in practice for so many years, what I noticed within the first few years of practice was that although I was helping people, they were actually coming back with the same problem, the same condition year after year. And especially when I started treating patients that were quite elderly, um, I also noticed that I, I, was, I had great successes, amazing successes with chiropractic. Um, it's, it's so brilliant for looking after people. But what I also noticed was that at a certain age, it would get to a point where they could come and they could come on a monthly basis. But after a while, they're like, you know what, this isn't working anymore. Um, and then they'd say, oh my God, I have to come once a week now. And that's keeping the pain away. But it was either unaffordable or maybe they would get a reaction or they'd feel sore still for a few days. And so they were battling a lot with, um, you know, the benefits of coming to get adjusted and get themselves corrected or get themselves worked on versus like, well, the pain just keeps coming back. So what should I do? Mm -hmm. So that's when I really started looking into our patients' conditions and realizing, you know what, like I am adjusting people, I'm making some great changes, but underneath there are some underlying structural problems that are causing this condition to recur. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I decided to look a bit deeper and look into the research. What can we do to actually change this, not just the pain, but the, the problem, the underlying problem? And that's mm -hmm. when I found chiropractic biophysics. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Dee Harrison and his father, Don Harrison, actually created this amazing technique mm -hmm. um, that I've been working with them. I've been studying under them for uh, since 2003, 2004. So a really long time. And they've put in so much research into mm -hmm. this technique mm -hmm. on how to do uh, non-surgical corrective structural care. So it's, mm. it's quite exciting 
um, mm -hmm. to be in this field and to see these changes and these results and to see the research now coming out and really supporting what we do, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, <laughs> yes. Right. So, uh, one of the uh, uh, the, the the most obvious uh, cases uh, for for the non constructive uh, uh, re uh, non invasive reconstructive care it's uh, the so called uh, you know the slip disc or the spondylolis uh, uh, itis. Um, but uh, what is the beyond so today we're going to go more deeper in into the uh, slip disc uh, kind of a situation but beyond this wh what are the other kind of conditions can the uh, non-invasive uh, reconstructive care uh, help oh, there you go sorry i lost you for a second oh. so with what we're doing what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about the spondylolis thesis mm -hmm. so what i want everyone to understand as well the most common mistake that people can make with back pain is they think of course well you've got back pain i've got back pain we've got the same problem right and so that is something that needs to be understood is that not everyone has the same problem even though you might have the same pain Mm -hmm. So what we want to talk about today is one of these underlying conditions, which is called the spondylolis thesis. Mm -hmm. uh, it starts with the spondylolysis, but I'll go into that explanation. Mm -hmm. And it's just basically a type of nerve root entrapment that occurs from the spine, from a complication in the spine. Mm -hmm. um, but other complications that we uh, deal with, absolutely, we do deal with slip discs. So we deal with herniated discs, and we'll go through that definitely on another day, because that is a, a whole concept in itself how we do that non-surgically um but we also deal with um uh, like someone that may not realize that they have a short leg uh and the, so the spine will cause degeneration and buckling people mm -hmm. that have uh the spine that starts to lean over uh and trap nerves um whiplash accidents where the spine the ligaments have been damaged the spine can actually reverse in its position in the neck um, so lots of different conditions including uh, hyperkyphosis in the thoracic spine mm -hmm. posture problems um, lots of different so many different things that we can actually treat with this by the traction forces by putting these specific applied forces to the spine um, to bring it towards alignment. So it's like braces on children's teeth. We're able to realign the internal structure and that makes big changes in the spine and in the body. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to going through all the different complicated cases that we deal with here at the Health Lodge. Yeah, this is really... Yeah, yeah, this so I thought really today good. this is going to be enough already because uh, a spondylolis thesis is... Yep. It's huge um, and it happens in young, elderly. It's massive um, but yeah we'll, yeah we'll, we'll talk yeah, about yeah. Lisa, that's let's that's just uh, dive right in let's talk about the spondylolis uh, thesis uh, yeah. you know what is it and uh, how why is it critical to, to 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 correct it and what are the possibilities for correcting it. Brilliant. So some of the interesting things about what a spondylolis thesis is, is first of all, um, there's usually, there could be two causes. Um, one would be, it could be um, an underlying defect in a person's spine. So they could have a congenital abnormality of the spine, which then causes, it, it, it stops the vertebra themselves. So when we look at what a vertebra, what the vertebra look like, so we have these lovely little bones here. Mm -hmm. And what's important about the vertebra is that it's just like a bicycle chain. One hinge fits into the other hinge and these hinges so just move and glide together. Mm -hmm. And um, what's amazing about the spine is that we have these natural stoppers at the back. Mm -hmm. So although vertebra can slip backwards if we tear the ligaments, and we'll go through that on one of our when we talk about correction of different types of problems, but the spondylolis thesis is an anterior slippage. So there's several names for a spondylolis thesis. Anterior meaning forward. Forward. So you can call it, um, here in the UK, they also call it anter uh, anterolis thesis. Uh, they, you will also hear it at, called uh, a stress fracture mm -hmm. because it does happen quite often as well in the young, but often in the elderly. Mm -hmm. where the vertebra will just crack. So what, uh, what happens is when I push these bones, they should never slip forwards mm -hmm. because we have these little stopper mechanisms there, right. yeah. which is uh, the articular facets, the pars interarticularis. So we've got lots of bone that actually just stops it from gliding forwards. Mm -hmm. But if we break or have a fall or have an injury, mm -hmm. you can crack 
this part of the spine. You can crack here at the pars. And what, what will happen is that the spine will actually slip forwards. Mm -hmm. As it slips forwards, mm -hmm. it will trap the nerve. So it traps the spinal cord and the nerves going down into the legs. Mm -hmm. Now, if the vertebra has a little bit of torsion to it, mm -hmm. you might get the pain down one leg. Mm -hmm. And so we have often patients that come in and they're like, I have sciatica. Mm -hmm. And so they may think they have a disc prolapse, mm -hmm. but really then when we look at the underlying condition, we're saying, no, actually there's something there, which could be a fracture. Mm -hmm. It could be again, because if, and in some cases, and I'll show you some examples, in some cases, patients have like a spina bifida occulta, they'll have like a small birth defect at the base of the spine. Mm -hmm. And that means that the bone isn't shaped as naturally or normally as the others would be. And then if it's not shaped properly, it might not have those mechanical stoppers blocking it. So it can slip forwards and again, trap those nerves. But mm -hmm. it, what it does is it can progress. So mm -hmm. in other words, over time, mm -hmm. at first, it'll start to just nip the nerves and give you some back pain or some mm -hmm. shooting leg pain. And then it could suddenly go away. Mm -hmm. But then over time, then you start getting more nagging pain and it can grab the spinal cord and both nerves going down both legs and just cut off. So in other words, you can get complete weakness, numbness, loss of bladder function. Uh, yeah. So it's quite, it can be quite a debilitating condition as it progresses. Right, right. Besides the non-invasive uh, corrective care, what yes. are the traditional methods of uh, addressing this uh, problem? So in early stage, which is what is kind of um, early stages, uh, you can do that chiropractic, physiotherapy can be quite effective, chiropractic exercises, because we're getting right in there, we're getting the movement, and we can just get the pain to shift. But again, like I said, what we want to do is make sure that we're correcting the problem. We want to make sure that the slippage isn't going any further. We want to stabilize it and hold it in position. Mm -hmm. um, over time though, the more that that slippage progresses, so we can grade the actual spondylolisthesis, grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four. Once we start moving into grade three to four, then you're looking at a surgical procedure mm -hmm. to even stabilize. Mm -hmm. So what, what is important about the surgical procedures is that it doesn't actually correct. It's mm -hmm. meant to stabilize and pre prevent progression. Mm -hmm. So, but at a certain stage, depending on how much it slipped, they're not able to, to go into that surgery, pull that bone and pull it back out. Mm -hmm. They're just able to clamp down, tighten up the screws a bit, which may give it a little bit of correction, try mm -hmm. to get the pressure off the nerves. But again, their, their point is to stop it from progressing further. So now, in other words, in other words, it's uh, if the patient is uh, at a stage three, then the, the, uh, the, the surgery just help the patients to, to stay at the stage three, yeah. not progressing further, but cannot help the patients to come back to stage two or two. No. Uh, from what I've seen and from what I've discussed with um, some of the surgeons that I've met and some of the patients that I've gone to see the surgeons is that there's a certain amount that they could correct. It's mm -hmm. still quite minimal, mm -hmm. but it's not like a full correction. Mm -hmm. From the patients that I have seen mm -hmm. with, um, that have then gone to get stabilization uh, mm. as a surgical procedure, it's not like they don't have problems that don't progress. I mean, the younger you are when you get it done, you can imagine now you have 20, 30 years of your back mm. with screws, bolts, and a cage in it. Um, over time, again, the bladder nerves get irritated, the back gets weak because now you're not exercising, you're not able to bend and look after yourself the same way as you used to. So we still get some natural progression, unfortunately, of symptoms, mm -hmm. even with stabilization surgery in itself. Mm -hmm. um, but in obviously in some severe situations, that's so important for them is to just stabilize that spine, hold it and stop it from dropping. Right. You mentioned that uh, this, uh, this, this is, uh, problem is a self-reinforcing, self-progressing process. Why? Why is it self-progressing? Self yeah, again, it does depend on the specific patient and their condition and their case. Um, there are some that will progress and there are some that won't. It really depends if the bone is stopping or being blocked in any way. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you can have what we call a bilateral pars fracture, which means that both sides are broken and the bone can slip freely. Mm -hmm. The way you have to understand with this condition first, it can happen when you're young. Mm -hmm. So um, 
uh, you know, I had a, a patient that came in, she was 15 years old mm -hmm. and she had sciatica. So any child with sciatica, it's already uh, like, um, it's not normal. Mm -hmm. And so, and especially if that sciatica is lasting more than six months, mm -hmm. then, you, you know, as a practitioner, I'm going to investigate that further. And so when I did my tests on her, I saw that it didn't seem like a ridiculous type of discopathy. It didn't seem like a disc pain. It really seemed like the nerve was being pinched for some reason. Um, so it really felt like mechanical, the bone is pinching on the nerve, what's going on? And so then when we took her x-rays, we saw absolutely she had uh, a grade one spondylolisthesis. Mm -hmm. So, when she was 11, she was wearing those little wheelie shoes mm -hmm. and she remembers slipping on in Sainsbury's, oh, yeah. slipping up and falling directly on her back and like she said, cracking her coccyx. Mm -hmm. And so she had a lot of pain. She was just 11 years old. Mm -hmm. And that is most likely when the incident occurred. Mm -hmm. so in other words, these fractures, these breaks that we get in the PARS can mm -hmm. happen years before the pain actually starts. Mm -hmm. so then what happens is you, what you happen is you crack it. And at that point, it's called a spondylolysis. Mm -hmm. So you get the breakage, but you don't necessarily get the translation. So mm -hmm. it cracks. Translation so, meaning moving forward. So moving forwards. Mm -hmm. So with a normal bone, for example, with your arm, you break it, they see the break, they can cast it, and then automatically hold those two bones together and they'll fuse. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, with the spine, because we put so much pressure in those spinal segments, so in other words, you, you know, even just bending down to brush your teeth mm -hmm. puts 500, 400 to 500 pounds of shearing pressure, mm -hmm. shearing force between the L5 and S1. Mm -hmm. So because of that, when the, that break occurs, mm -hmm. it's, it's almost impossible to put those two bones back together mm -hmm. to let them fuse again. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. often it goes unnoticed as well. Like, the, the, you know, you'll have pain and then, okay, within a few weeks you're moving again and you just forget about it. You mm -hmm. just don't realize, oh, something's actually cracked or broken. You just feel sore and quite winded. Mm -hmm. But once the two bones are separated, unless they're tripping the nerve, mm -hmm. you'll have some soreness and some bruising, but you may not realize that actually the break has occurred. So mm -hmm. it's not like a weight bearing on a leg. You're hobbling around and you can hardly walk in your back because the two bones actually move apart a little bit. Mm -hmm. Unless it's actually hitting neural and dural tissues, you may not realize that this happened at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's quite common with uh, gymnastics, gymnasts as well. Mm -hmm. um, and even with gymnasts, what can often happen is they can remodel the bones. In other words, those little bones here can remodel and lengthen, which will allow the bone to then slip. Mm -hmm. um, the great news is, is if it's just what we call um, an isthmic, and this is what we call an isthmic type spondylolisthesis, so it would be much like I explained that you could have a spina bifida, you have a little bit of a, a congenital abnormality. So if we have that, then the bone will slip, but it may not go to like a grade three or a grade four because the posterior elements are still attached. Yeah. But when the posterior that's elements true. are no longer attached, that's when it can really progress and can really slip forwards. Right, so right, right. you do this when you're young, and then when you're in your 60s, 50s, 60s, you're, you know, you're a construction worker, you're building, you're lifting, you're doing things, yep. then it starts to gradually slip mm. little by little and mm. then move forward in that sense. Mm. So that's when we, we get those problems that it progresses over the years, it starts to drop and drop and mm. drop. Mm -hmm. yeah. You mentioned about this uh, grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four. So yeah. uh, obviously this is uh, quite important. C could you please explain what is ex uh, grade one? How yeah, sure. Now I'm not sure if you can see any of the graphics here on the screen. Okay. Yeah, um, we can see it. Yeah. I'll bring that quite big. Uh, so yeah, this is good. What we have here is we have the spine. And what we'll see is that first what will happen is we'll get this break in the actual bone here. Mm -hmm. And so there's a crack in between this area here, and that's on both sides of the actual vertebra. Mm -hmm. But with time, what will happen is you can see the spine slipping forwards mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, yeah. And it will slip all yeah. the way to yeah. here. Yeah. So when we look at the grading, it's an x-ray listing, and that's what is 
kind of great about what we do is that, you know, I have x-rays on site, I can take them, I can actually diagnose this condition and then see where we are with our progression. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we bisect the sacrum mm -hmm. and then we bisect it again. And so we are in it with four little marks on the sacrum. Mm -hmm. So as the as the slippage starts, if you're anywhere within that first quarter, then that's great one. Oh. As soon as you hit the line mm -hmm. of the second quarter going into the second half, you're in grade two. Mm -hmm. So once you start going into grade three, you're already basically 50% along the actual sacral base mm -hmm. with slippage. So the vertebra is really slipping out of position at that point. And then of mm -hmm. course, grade four, we're really moving into the last quarter of the actual oh. vertebra with the mm -hmm. slippage. What you have to understand is inside here is the spinal cord and nerves. Mm. So you can imagine that the, the neural arch itself mm. is here. And it's just basically, it's like a hoop of bone mm. like mm. that. Mm. And so you've got your spinal cord and your nerves going through that hoop of bone. Mm. You have another hoop of bone, mm. but your, your legs and your tailbone are here, but your spine is going there. So what's yeah. happening is you're mm. causing this kind of, cramping on the cord and nerves one part's going one way the other way is slipping that way so look the hole for the actual nerve suppressor is getting so small it starts to occlude cause what we call stenosis grab those nerve roots that are going down you're like choke them off pins and needles numbness tingling bladder issues like i said bladder incontinence bladder weakness all of these things from mm -hmm. those actual nerves in that area that's that's how it goes Right, yeah. So then how does the uh, non-invasive uh, reconstructive care come in to help these conditions? So with what we do, it's, um, so it's a combination, like I said, of several, several different techniques that we use. Uh, one being chiropractic in itself, and of course chiropractic biophysics. And also we do a lot of physiotherapy in our practice and rehabilitation, but it all really works together. Mm -hmm. And so I'll show you um, just an example so that we can see. Um, uh, and I'll try to send you some more of these so that you can have a look mm -hmm. at what we're doing. Um, let's just have, oh goodness, I just did a lovely presentation. Here we go. And so let's see if we can get this. Mm. So there's the, what happens there. So I'm not sure if you can see the difference in the actual picture can here. Move your monitor slightly. No, no, there's a camera. camera. Oh, this one, like yeah, that. This one. Okay. Yeah. I'm not sure if you can see the red line and the green line. I'm not sure if that's quite visible. Oh, it's very yeah. So what we'll do is I'll, I'll, Thank you. Yeah, I'll send them. I'll definitely send them to you so then you can see. So this okay. is an example. And this lady has an L4 fracture mm -hmm. here. And so we can see that the spine itself is 26 millimeters forwards. Often what will happen, especially with an L5 fracture, mm -hmm. is that as the bone slips forwards, you move mm -hmm. to a hyperlordosis. In mm -hmm. other words, your lumbar spine starts to slip forwards, your right. lower back starts to go deeper. Right, right. So in this case, we have uh, quite an anterior slippage of 26.2 uh, 26 millimeters forwards with a sacral base angle of 45 degrees 45.5 and normal we want that angle to be about 40 degrees mm -hmm. so what happens is the tailbone tips up the vertebra slip forward the spine slips forward mm -hmm. and so with our non-surgical reconstructive uh, traction with our procedures we were able to reduce that forward translation and you can see that although here it still says 20 millimeters and you may mm -hmm. think oh that's only six millimeters but actually when you see down at the bottom this is where the biggest change is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can see that the spondylolisthesis went from about six millimeters down to two so we can see a large translation that mm -hmm. the whole spine has shifted backwards the sacral mm -hmm. base itself has has changed as well and mm -hmm. we have a much better curve that mm -hmm in the actual lumbar spine. So we can mm -hmm. see a good stabilization and a good correction mm -hmm. of that L4 fracture. Mm -hmm. So in order to achieve this, now 
everybody is very different. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that L5 fractures are much easier to control than L4 fractures oh. uh, in, my, in, in my experience. The L4s just get a bit more complicated because they're up above the spinal cord a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And so if we get a lot of rotation and lateral translation and buckling, mm -hmm. then it really grabs the spinal cord and nerves. And it's very difficult to kind of release that because um, it's an unstable segment, it's moving. So as a chiropractor, I like being able to put my fingers on something and say, right, I'm gonna be able to move that. But in this situation, it's very tricky. So the movements have to be very gentle. We often use instrument adjusting. Mm -hmm. We often recoil, we work around the segments. Often if that fracture is there, I may not come in on the bone itself and move it directly. Mm -hmm. I may just move things around it or do um, in, in chiropractic biophysics, we do something called mirror image adjusting. So I may actually see, right, it's leaning over this way. Let's push it down that way. Um, so we do mobilization and adjustments. So actual manipulation of the segments. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, then we have an exercise routine that they need to follow. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we also have our, our non-surgical traction. Mm -hmm. Now L4 fracture mm -hmm. then, and depending on what, type of curve they have i'm going to be taking the vertebra and i'm going to be physically pulling them backwards mm -hmm. so we do have some traction units um, one is the universal traction uh unit that we have um and we can get them standing and we're physically pulling that bone backwards we're mm -hmm. pulling the sacral base down and we're almost doing a two-way kind of position where we're pulling the stomach back and pulling the tailbone down and then just realigning those vertebra and holding them there. And long term, once we start doing our tractions, they could be there for like 20 minutes. The more you do that, the more you reinforce that, the more it stays. So it's like bracing. So this this traction know. machine, yeah, this, this traction machine, is it a, a kind of a, the truck uh, similar to the traction machine that is used for the so-called uh, spinal decompression? Uh, no, oh, we do have decompression. And like I said, when we go over discopathy and issues with discopathy, we can go through that. Mm -hmm. um, we it, it's different because it is um that is more considered uh, an axial traction mm -hmm. whereas yeah. this is more like a 3d reconstruction mm -hmm. so in other words i've got like a cage mm -hmm. that we've built and that sounds like a terrible word but um we've got a traction device and we can pull in all directions so in other words if you're leaning over this side we're going to pull that over we're going to pull the spine back and we're going to hold it in a realigned position. So then the ligaments, the spine relax. And then it's like, oh, this is where I should be. Mm -hmm. And it starts to let go and it starts to hold its position better. And then, of course, we reinforce that with exercises. Mm -hmm. And then depending on how old they are, depending on how bad the situation is, then we choose a, a form of stabilization Mm -hmm. as well so that's where i would also suggest stabilization belting so that they wear a good stabilization belt mm -hmm. that will hold this tight for several hours a day they don't need to wear it all day just when they're doing especially you know lifting and bending where it's just going to pull that segment back out mm -hmm. so if we do that the stabilization belting the exercises then we get a good degree of correction mm -hmm. and then we also slow down that progression because mm -hmm. yes, even though I can correct it, great, it looks amazing now, but if you stop care, stop exercising, it can drop back. So what we do is then encourage self-care, maintenance care, and stabilization belting to mm -hmm. then prevent any further recurrence and progression. And it really slows that down. Um, uh, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's what we're trying to see, how long and how much. Um, but with time, we know that uh, through the research done on chiropractic biophysics, the rate of progression um, is definitely slowed down by just monthly maintenance care. Um, whereas if you don't do any maintenance care, then they see a 20% progression year on year. In other words, it will slip back, it will slip back, it will slip back. It won't be exactly what it was, but it will slowly start to progress back because you can't take away gravity. 
Right. right. <laughs> and if you're not exercising, you're not holding it in place. So it's not a permanent correction like screws and bolts. Mm -hmm. But again, it's not a permanent correction like screws and bolts. Well, um, it's, you know, yeah. it's almost like, a go, you know, if you want to have a strong body, you got to, you know, go to the gym to exercise every day. If you don't do exercise, you, you lose your muscle, your strength. So yeah. it's a very similar kind of situation. This is a fascinating. This yeah. helps a lot of... Uh, patients that uh, otherwise would go through a surgery uh, yes. you know, to avoid that uh, hassle and cost. Exactly. That, that's, our, that's our plan is especially to avoid, well, it's, yeah, it's avoid the, you know, especially if they're quite young, when we see this, mm -hmm. uh, then it's just to get a plan, get a plan of action now mm -hmm. rather than leaving it um, until it's too late, or for some people, at least, you know what, great, we're gonna avoid the surgery for another five years or 10 mm -hmm. years, and avoid it for as long as possible, mm -hmm. uh, depending on what grade they're in, then at least they know, right, I can stay this, this way. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned to you earlier when we were chatting, mm -hmm. um, we are now gonna be moving into actually a real strong, aggressive stabilization bracing, Mm -hmm. uh, which is run by um, a company called Scully Brace mm -hmm. uh, to, to really look at the posture patterns that people have and then making sure, again, to prevent that progression. Because some of them, you see here I'm showing you a picture where it's slipping forwards, mm -hmm. but with a lot of people, they're actually slipping sideways as well. Mm -hmm. And that sideways buckling on an unstable fracture, mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's not going to stop. Mm -hmm. you know, every year you will see a progression mm -hmm. of a few degrees year mm -hmm. on year because mm -hmm. that is there's not enough core strengthening once women you know are in their 60s and 70s you know the strength of the muscles just isn't there we can see that the, the postural collapse is just gravity is too great the bones are too brittle it's mm -hmm. not going to hold Mm -hmm. uh, which actually leads me to another interesting fact because we were talking about uh, like other types of care that you could do mm -hmm. um, often when people have the pain mm -hmm. because they you know the doctors don't want to operate because it might be that it's not it's not a big enough spondylolisthesis in other words if the grading isn't too bad then they may not want to actually do surgery straight away mm -hmm. what they may do is um do actually uh steroid injections mm -hmm. but of course when you get a steroid injection the problem is that that increases then the chance of spinal fractures by 25 percent for each you know, for each injection. So if you're getting injections into your facets, into the ones above and below, then the chance of those then progressing to become a fracture, uh, it gets greater. So what we see is as the bones get brittle, we get more injections, and then we'll see even uh, a secondary spondylolisthesis in the segment above. Mm -hmm. So we'll have an L5 fracture, an L4 fracture. I've had L4 and L3, or we have even compression fractures that occur because... Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, a corticosteroid injection does weaken um, the cortex, the bone, and so we can get these minor breaks in the spine oh, as well. Interesting. So you, you must have a, a lot of uh, successes uh, in, in this, uh, helping the uh, patients with these conditions. So uh, could you please uh, share with us some, some of those miracle cases? That, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. So we do. I was, I was actually talking to one of the ladies today, um, mm -hmm. and um, with, yeah, with what we do. I mean, um, it, it is amazing because we will get some elderly that are just, you know, can't even walk twenty meters. Like mm -hmm. that's it, you know. And and their biggest joy isn't, you know, they they don't necessarily want to do a huge amount, but they they just want to be able to walk their grandchildren to school. Mm -hmm. or be able to cook or walk to the shops mm -hmm. without this excruciating pain searing down their legs. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, definitely we have one lady at the moment who I've started working on her in, for several different conditions, but she does have a spinal fracture down mm -hmm. in the lower back. And I mean, I remember when she came in because she's got a walker. Mm -hmm. So she's leaning and she's mm -hmm. hunching and she's going really slow and she doesn't have any strength in her legs. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. now that we've been working with her, mm -hmm. um, and of course we did, we, we've done some treatment, we've done um, some very gentle treatment with her. She is quite elderly, she is in her 80s. Oh. Um, but we were able to, again, 
get some movement, get some relief. And then we started with stabilization bracing. And with that, I'm, she was able to stand upright. She oh. was able to stand without even using her walker. And her daughter was, she, she was, she just went outside to the car. She's like, okay, I'm going. And she just <laughs> walked out and her daughter was like, oh my God, I have to keep up with her now. So it, it's, it can be quite remarkable. Um, right. Just get some mobility back you know right. it doesn't mean that they're going to be uh, perfect mm -hmm. but in the, in for them that is the the biggest change it's like oh i'm able to stand i'm able to uh, go to the shop i'm able to do you know just do just walk uh, this mm -hmm. you know i think after a few sessions with this lovely lady um her daughter she went out in the garden and sat out in the garden and her daughter was like she hasn't done that in months um, <laughs> And of course, her daughter is now looking after her. So that it's quite hard for people. You're caring after an elderly parent right. and, you know, they're, they're disabled. They're not able to do things for themselves. So it just gives them that little bit more. Like, oh, my God. Like, I don't have to uh, be worried as much. Uh, yeah, this is really remarkable because, uh, uh, you know, a little bit of a, a, a better uh, mobility obviously means a lot of, to life. And especially for these kind of uh, older people, the, uh, the, 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 the option, the, the surgery is uh, not an option at all. It is. And, of course, you know, nobody should go to, to go through their surgery to, for anything. The hardest thing is that, especially as the condition does progress and as people get quite elderly, surgery may not be possible. Depending on the brittleness of the bones, they may yeah. not, you know, you could put screws in there, but that doesn't mean that they'll hold. Right, right. So there's lots of, yeah, lots of complications around that. So um, the, the non-surgical way, um, it's just that it, it's really rewarding to be able to see such a change mm -hmm. in a complicated condition. Because like I said, it is a complicated condition. It's an mm -hmm. unstable fracture. Um, and some of the buckling patterns people will get um, significant disability from. Mm -hmm. um, and like I say, it may not be correctable by surgery, yes. depending on how, That's you know, how severe it is. And like I said, I can show you lots of cases where I'm like, wow, like we need to stabilize that. We need mm -hmm. to stop that because mm -hmm. we know, I know where it's going to go to. Mm -hmm. um, but like I said, it's, yeah, it's quite, it's quite interesting. Not yes. all cases will go that way. But you have to look at, and that's what, you know, that's what I do is I evaluate everyone's uh, right. condition quite carefully yeah. to see yeah. what's so happening. In many uh, cases, uh, actually, the uh, non-invasive reconstructive care is not only the better solution, but it sometimes it's, it's even the only it, yeah. Right. yeah, as as patients get quite elderly, it's, mm -hmm. right. it's good. And if it doesn't work, and we know usually within quite a few weeks, whether or not we're making some changes, because with the elderly, it's like, you know, they're not going to, you know, if they're not seeing a change, it's hard enough for them to get out of the house to get to us. So mm -hmm. if they're not seeing a change, then we know that straight away. Mm -hmm. um, but we will work really hard with them. Um, but then, you know, yeah, we've got to do our best to try to, to try to get this to change. So right. it, it is, yeah, it's sometimes yeah, we're the only ones that will actually do that work with them because it's not often that at the hospital the physiotherapist will sit down and exercise with them or even treat them it's just it would be painkillers and injections in most cases right. yeah. so we've been awesome. talking about uh, the non-surgical solution for uh spondyl thesis uh in other words uh, this is the slip the disc condition, uh, which is normally it's, it's actually, yeah. Sorry about that. It's the slipped vertebra condition, right? Exactly. Vertebra itself. So the discs will actually bulge as well. Um, mm. I can see. So this is the thing. Is is you know I make it sound easy, but. <laughs> a no, lot. it's not. No, it's not. This is really, uh, actually, it's quite amazing. When I heard that you had uh, this specialty, I'm quite, uh, quite amazed. Um, now, could you please uh, let us know uh, a bit more about, uh, you know, what, what kind of uh, spondylitis uh, thesis is the non-constructive, uh, no, non-invasive constructive care, uh, reconstructive care, uh, the best for, and uh, what kind of uh, spondylitis uh, uh, thesis is the uh, non-invasive -re reconstructive care not the best suited is there a, such difference if so what yeah so with um with what i do definitely um it, fractures of l5 mm -hmm. and grades uh like 
anything from a spondylolysis to a grade one um, is usually, that is the best. That actually responds really well um, because we're able to, um, one of the great things about being a chiropractor is we're able to do spinal manipulation. So we're able to unlock segments because that's the biggest thing is that the vertebra will slip and they'll lock and they'll pinch and they'll catch. Yeah. And with an L5, um, depending on obviously the stability, but if it's an early grade, then I'm able to do specific spinal adjustments to the sacrum, to the tailbone. I'm able to move things around, unlock things, unblock things. And like I said, we've got, we've got our routine, we've got our routine sorted on that one, uh, where we can, we can decompress a little bit, we can move the bones, we can translate them and it gets the best traction. Uh, it's, it's really good. As we start moving up into the higher segments, like I said, the, the, the problem there is that it will trap the spinal cord more. Mm -hmm. So those conditions where um, the, like the L4 often, or even L3, often what will happen is you'll get the anterior slippage, but you'll also get a torsion, a twisting, and a side buckling. Oh. And that's when it becomes far more complicated. Mm -hmm. So again, I've had some L4 fractures. Maybe they've only had like been a grade one, um, the way they haven't slipped that much, but they're excruciating. The nerve damage that's in there is quite mm -hmm. severe because mm -hmm. it's gripping the spinal cord at such a, a more a more neurological input in that area, mm -hmm. um, and and it's affecting the spine above mm -hmm. uh, very much so. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's just a harder one to control. Mm -hmm. um, those are, those are harder. Um, and they definitely, um, I've been finding that they require bracing as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and like I said, we're, we're going to try to move into more aggressive bracing. Mm -hmm. So something more of like a body cast in a corrected position to hold people in the right place mm -hmm. to again, stabilize them there. Mm -hmm. um, but it won't weaken their muscles because of the way that the brace is built. So that's really important as well. Mm -hmm. um, but those are the ones that they, they do respond. They're much more difficult and then add osteoporosis in there where the bones are fracturing and kind of crumbling then that again that complicates the condition more so right. they they may not respond as well mm -hmm. um or at all compared to uh you know like an l5 which is mm -hmm. yeah great the pain goes away so quickly mm -hmm. whereas an l4 the pain does drag on and we have to do a lot more work mm -hmm. a lot more work mm -hmm. if if we're able to save them at all mm -hmm that that's the hard thing yeah. okay now is there any does it make a difference of between the, the uh, grade one but grade two grade four no definitely the further along you go uh grade two and beyond you're, you're really looking like surgical intervention mm -hmm. is going to be necessary at one point mm -hmm. because of the amount of neurological damage it can okay. cause mm -hmm. so and it doesn't always cause pain mm -hmm. we have a lady that just started uh, just two weeks ago and um, you know she just started noticing some pulling sensations and some strange sensations and mm -hmm. um, we're seeing like whoa this is already a grade two spondylolisthesis. thesis mm -hmm. we're like okay <laughs> we need to correct and we need to stabilize and brace and it's a bit of a shock because it's like well I don't have any pain because mm -hmm. pain isn't you know pain is not the problem you know the, the problem is that it, it, you know you you know paralyzed people don't feel pain for example <laughs> it's not it's it's, it's the nerve function, like right. the damage to the nerves, the spinal cord, and the complete occlusion that will weaken the legs and cause the problems, mm -hmm. not necessarily the pain in itself. Mm -hmm. um, so it's quite, yeah, it's quite interesting that mm -hmm. way. What, what about the age, age of the patient? Uh, young? It, the... Yeah, the age of the patient, obviously the younger they are, the more exercises they can do, the easier, and the more stability they have in their core. Mm -hmm. um, what a, you know, what's quite difficult with women is after menopause, often, uh, you know, we'll see some patients where all of a sudden they go through menopause and then all of a sudden all their symptoms start coming up because musculature, like your, your basal metabolic rate starts to change, your musculature starts to change. And, and over time as well, people, you know, with sedentary work styles, mm -hmm. um, eat, you know, their, their core muscles will weaken. And so we'll see that definitely as people age, it gets more difficult. And as I mentioned, you know, you, you, the stress fractures are more common as people get older. Mm -hmm. So I'll see someone where, you know, they fell, 
uh, on the down the stairs maybe two or three years ago and now it's you can see it's progressed already to a grade one or a grade two with the lateral translation mm -hmm. what we see as um, women and men get older is often you'll see like if you had a tiny curve when you were uh, an adult um, we'll see that progress and then you add that stress fracture in there and the whole thing will start to change shape very quickly and you've got to catch and hold on to it so that it doesn't split itself apart really mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so as people get older it is more difficult but again that's where the bracing, the stabilization. So that's why we've worked on this process where we've got treatment is the first mm -hmm. to get rid of the pain and kind of untrap the nerves as much as possible and get that, get, get everybody feeling good. We've mm -hmm. got rehabilitation strengthening, which is an important stage as well, teaching them how to take care of themselves. But then, as I mentioned, we've got bracing and stabilization that we also want to do. Because we want to, once we put things in the right place, we want to hold them there. So often what we'll see is, let's say we do a great treatment, they feel fantastic, but then the pain comes back slowly as they go home. So we can brace them, stabilize them, hold them in place. They continue their exercises. So they get stronger because it's not slipping back out. And then over time as well, that will prevent it from this progression, which is eventual because like I said, gravity doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, and age doesn't go away. <laughs> You're getting older and gravity is pulling on it. So it does split. We do see that vertebra tend to slip with time. Right, right, right. So by stabilizing it, even up to four hours a day, mm -hmm. just doing things you're holding things in place you're getting uh, a stronger correction and you're holding that correction as well which is what we want mm -hmm. the last thing that i want is for someone to say oh i've done all this treatment with you and now uh, the pains come back mm -hmm. uh, or the conditions come back that mm -hmm. you haven't really fixed me and that's why yes it's not a permanent fix in other words i'm not putting screws and deadbolts in there but what I am doing is I'm putting it in the right place. And then, yes, we're going to hold it. We're going to stabilize it and keep it there. That's, that's the key. It's that long-term success we've got to work for. Right, right, right. Obviously, for the long-term success of the people, uh, the patients need to uh, continue with the treatment and the exercises and so on and so forth. Yeah. But initially, uh, how long would it take roughly uh, to get to see some results? Uh, so normally we we will get um some pain changes and it doesn't mean that we're going to get a full resolution of pain mm -hmm. some people do mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of people don't because like i said it's an unstable segment so we need a lot of strength and stability to hold it in the right place mm -hmm. um, but in most cases within about 12 procedures so usually for us people come twice a week i live in london uh, people don't have time on their hands and so twice a week even you know for them to come or for their child to bring them that's enough so we see them twice a week and we do that initially for about six weeks mm -hmm. by the end of 12 procedures um, we're able to see a change in mm -hmm. other words it may not be perfect but we're able to see a decrease in pain and an increase in flexibility mm -hmm. um, by 24 procedures where we follow through we continue twice a week again for another six weeks so in total about 12 weeks mm -hmm. that's when we see a much stronger stabilization because mm -hmm. as the pain starts to go we're able to do more exercises we're really able to hold correct like just keep uh, you know, keep the core stronger, build up on that strength. And especially if they're elderly, that's going to take a bit more time than someone that's young to build up strength mm -hmm. and do exercises and it tires them out quite quickly. So mm -hmm. by 12 weeks, we're able to see some stabilization. So in other words, they're able to do more before the pain comes back mm -hmm. uh, and able to, to really hold that. When we're looking at changes in x-rays, mm -hmm. this normally takes about 36 procedures so that could be 18 weeks mm -hmm. where we're seeing them twice a week mm -hmm. Obviously, if they could come three times a week then we'd see that a bit sooner mm -hmm. but we will see changes on x-rays that's the research technique and the, the research itself is not on spondylolisthesis but it's on overall general curve structure mm -hmm. and so what i'm able to do is take that take all of that knowledge and then work on these conditions that these people have right. and bring them into a pattern of correction. So mm -hmm. then by 36 procedures, we re-X-ray, we're able to see that visible change. Mm -hmm. And then that's when also we want to start, you know, moving them towards, now you're going to maintain this. Mm -hmm. so 
how, where are we? So we reassess every 12 procedures. Mm -hmm. And we're like, well, where are we now? Let's move towards um, stabilizing, bracing as well, exercising and seeing how this is changing for them. Mm -hmm. um, so then we know, right, this is, this is where we are. Now we can move on to our maintenance phase, which is again, continue with these exercises. Right. We wanna progress the exercises. Right. We wanna make sure that it's staying the same, um, that they've, they've got what they wanted, mm -hmm. we've made a visible change, let's keep that. And then at the end of a year, we can check again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, for a person who has, uh, you know, a patient who has the uh, spondylolis thesis, and they, the person may have been to a hospital and had a X-ray, and uh, the person probably said, uh, being advised to say, "Well, you have this uh, uh, this condition, you need to go through a surgery." And the person was wondering, "Should I go through surgery? Should I not? Uh, how could they? Um, how could they?" Uh, find out on their own or do a rough initial kind of assessment to see whether the non-invasive reconstructive care would help them to avoid the potential surgery? Yeah, that's a really hard question because obviously once you see like a spinal surgeon, especially in this country, a lot of times um, people will take that advice as, well, that's, that's what they say. This is what I need to do. Mm -hmm. And I completely understand that because from a medical point of view in a hospital, absolutely, this is the right approach for what this person has. And in the long run, stabilizing it with bolts and screws, you can see that's gonna make those changes. Mm -hmm. So that's the hard thing with what, um, what we do is that no, it, it's not out there that you can correct this uh, non-surgically. In other words, there's no real, I don't, I don't think there's a specific randomized clinical control trial for these fractures um, that says, yes, if we apply this, this is what's going to happen every time. Mm -hmm. So that research hasn't been done yet. I'm hoping that we're going to you know, keep putting up case studies and then with our practice eventually, maybe because I seem to be getting a lot of these. Once you start, once you start doing something, <laughs> they seem to come your way. Mm -hmm. um, so then we could say, right, we could we could speak to uh, you know our primary care trust and say you know we've got an alternative solution this is what we do mm -hmm. um a lot of times often people are coming in and we're the ones that discover this for them they may not realize that they have this condition mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so it, it's quite difficult i think for people to know mm -hmm. that you can do something mm -hmm. uh, non-surgically i think often um, what I'm finding is that people will seek solutions through a chiropractor, mm -hmm. uh, which is fantastic, uh, or a physiotherapist, which is fantastic. So they'll be able to get that pain relief, mm -hmm. which is great. And then hopefully people will be able to see, right, oh, these people, which, because there's only a few of us, like in the UK, there's not that many doctors that actually do this kind of treatment. Exactly. Um, I think in America as well, uh, through chiropractic bug physics, there is just a small pool mm -hmm. of people that actually do this kind of treatment. So um, there is a website, it's called idealspine.com. Mm -hmm. um, and under Ideal Spine is the chiropractic biophysics uh, website. You can find a doctor of chiropractic there that practices this technique. They've got a register of everyone around the world. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there are very few. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a few that I know in Italy, France, uh, you know, in the UK, there's possibly like 20 of us i'd say uh, not many Indian population yeah it's not many that yeah. actually have all the equipment that do these techniques yeah. um you know we all know each other so that's great but um not many people know us um right. so yeah it's just a hidden a hidden gem okay um, of of technique that we do but we, well yeah we no, we see this we correct this we really work on it it's fantastic those changes mm -hmm. that we can do okay um, yeah. So, <laughs> so you, you said that the people should go to Ideal Spine to it's find kind of a, one of the specialists that are specialized in yeah. non-invasive yeah. reconstructive mm -hmm. care. In the not, yes. And then what I would also suggest, um, because, uh, and that, that pertains for you as well, is that, of course, we look at, um, I do look at bracing as one of those, uh, one of those key things that might help Mm -hmm. that can help mm -hmm. um so uh from that point of view we do have like our smaller 
braces, which mm-hmm. is a stabilization belt um, that I use on patients at the moment mm-hmm. as a trial to see also, depending on their condition, how severe it is. So I'm using this stabilization brace as a trial to see, do we need to do, or would aggressive, like a proper cast mm-hmm. of the spine in a mirror image position, a corrective casting mm-hmm. body brace, would that be helpful for this person? Mm-hmm. If, they, if the stabilization brace is helpful, mm-hmm. then depending on how severe their condition is, then that's at least the first stage where I'm like, yes, you are a good candidate If you're feeling good with just this brace, then I know that if we move towards treatment and a more stronger brace, Mm -hmm. um, you're going to get a great result from it. So Mm -hmm. it's like there's little things that we can trial to see how they're going to progress and react. And and it's the same thing, I think, with our care is always at the beginning, the first few sessions are there to see, can we get pain relief? Can we actually make a change? Mm -hmm. Trial all of these techniques and see, is this candidate going to work or is this going to be a surgical procedure? Um, The most important factor being neurological. Um, You know, I mean, if someone is having severe neurological impairment, which is what we measure when we do our orthopedic or neurological tests, then absolutely, you know, where you're at, right, you know, this is going to have to go to the hospital or great, you know what, it's getting better. Your reflexes are coming back. The strength is coming back in your legs. Uh, all of these little things that we can measure and monitor throughout the way um, mm-hmm. that are still really important. As a doctor, you need to follow these things through. Right, right, right. You, you mentioned about the uh, uh, the, the uh, corrective belt. Um, yes. Now th- this uh, belt, there are a lot of uh, there are yes. a lot of the belts on the market. You know, one of those most common one are those big black belt. Uh, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. Like one of those uh, weightlifting people using. Yeah. What what do those things work, or do, do they need to be something specially designed? So the one, so the ones that, um, as I said, the the kind of like the thing that i'm going to be hopefully moving towards uh the scully brace is quite a large body correction uh Uh so and what it does as well because what i've noticed especially with like l4 fractures and um is that like because it it doesn't become when you know it's not like it's the whole uh, you know, it's just that area of the spine that's broken, the whole posture becomes shifted. Right. Yeah. So you'll see like a whole anterior body translation. Mm-hmm. Or in um, certain cases, what we'll see is um, we'll see um, the, the spine itself mm-hmm. um, start to slip out of alignment. So the whole spine will start to shift out of uh, position. So um, I'll show you just an example of a, an L4 fracture. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, and the L4, like I mentioned, is, is usually the trickier one. Um, so I'm not sure if that's actually visible there. I'll highlight that there. Mm-hmm. Um, but we can see, you know, there's a there's a break here, and this this is a more this is the other thing you can. You can't necessarily age these, but you can start to tell uh, there's telltale signs. So mm-hmm. in her case, um, although she's 61, um, mm-hmm. there's a quite a nice preserved disc space in between the L4 and L5 disc, which means this is a more recent one because if the break happened, let's say 20 years ago, that disc normally degenerates quite quickly. And mm-hmm. so we'll see that bone on bone appearance. And often we'll see the L5 disc actually thin a lot faster than the L4 disc on the fracture. But you can't just look at the fracture and say, oh, that fracture is six years old. There's no way to kind of tell that. It's um, unfortunate, but we can look at disc degeneration. But uh, for example, in her case, um, oh, this isn't as good an example as I thought it was, but her spine is slipping sideways. Mm-hmm. Um, although I do have a, her posture photos accentuate it much better. Mm-hmm. Um, so in her case, uh, because she works a lot, mm-hmm. uh, still, we are looking at more aggressive bracing mm-hmm. for her. She, you know, she's got this condition. She, she's 61. Mm-hmm. She wants to work for another, you know, seven to 10 years, <laughs> unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, and then she's got to make it through her 80s. So we're going to, I will update you on how it goes. Okay. Um, but what we're looking at is more of 
the type of uh, whole body kind of bracing. Oh. In other words, um, mm -hmm. let me see if I can get just an image of the actual brace itself. Um, so we're going to look at um, like full, mm -hmm. well, sorry, I wish I could bring that image up a bit bigger for you. Uh, they do this a lot in children for scoliosis, but what mm -hmm. we're seeing is that it works as well in um, adult scoliosis, so degenerative scoliosis, mm -hmm. because if you've got a scoliosis, mm -hmm. you've got a curvature in the spine, and unfortunately, then as an adult, again, it's going to progress. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, you know, a lot of people think that progression in scoliosis is only when you're a teenager, mm -hmm. but then as you degenerate, it will progress as well. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing that this type of hard cast bracing will help mm -hmm. to not only because it's a it's a body casting that corrects at the same time so that's going to be an aggressive kind of correction a mm -hmm. nice stronger one i don't think aggressive aggressive should be the word um, but it's going to be a strong enough um correction there to withstand the forces and prevent that progression so what we see in a scoliosis for example mm -hmm. yep. is that whereas you would get perhaps a two to three degree progression every year so the spine will continue to drop a few degrees mm -hmm. what they're saying is that bracing cuts it down to 0.5 mm -hmm. so every year your spine is continuing to tip and what we're seeing is that you well you can hold that back mm -hmm. if you do this kind of bracing one of the braces uh that i'm using at the moment mm -hmm. uh is from a company called tuan uh, it's a french company Mm -hmm. And it's got like a nice strong corset mm -hmm. at the back. So it's got this type of attachment mm -hmm. that when you tie and tighten it more than a double pull, it creates a big corset, but it has, it's long enough to stabilize sacrum to spine, mm -hmm. still give the flexibility in the front for people to do things, mm -hmm. but it, it just holds that lumbar spine so stable people mm -hmm. are able to do more but it doesn't correct mm -hmm. whereas the scoli brace is more like a corrective so it'll help with the lateral side buckling and a few other things like that mm -hmm. and that's what like i'm going to be trialing out and testing on patients mm -hmm. on, on the ones that have these conditions where i think yeah that's going to really make a difference for them so mm -hmm. I'll, I'll update you i'll let you know yeah, please <laughs> please um, yeah. yeah, this is fr fascinating. So um, for a person, for a patient with the, uh, you know, slip disc or bundle, all these things, um, what, 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 uh, what, uh, what may be the top three advices or tips you would give them? Um, well, I think um, number one is definitely, uh, you know, not, not all therapists are the same. So oh. I, I think that's, you know, it, it's, it's really tough because some people will be like, oh, I saw this person and this didn't work. And I saw that person and that didn't work or don't go see this person, only go see this or only go see that. Um, you've really got to see the person that's right for you, that knows what's happening with you and actually has a plan of action. The and, right specialty for that condition. Absolutely. And it doesn't mean, oh, you, you should only see a chiropractor uh, because in our, in our clinic, uh, it's multidisciplinary, but we're patient centered. So in other words, when you come into the practice, it's, it's really about you. What's wrong with you? What do you need? Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, you need physiotherapy. You need mm -hmm. it for this. Yes, you need, you know, chiropractic. You need it for this. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's really a, a mixture of things that are going to help mm -hmm. uh, this condition, not just uh, one specific therapy. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why we use, like I said, we, we phase it out into several stages where we've got the pain relief which is great, but then we've got that structural rehabilitation and exercises, mm. uh, we've got corrections that we follow all the way through, and then we've got that final stabilization and maintenance. Mm -hmm. So it's also understanding, so that's number one, is, is making sure you've got the right team to look after mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and then the second thing is also realizing that it's this is long-term, right? The bones have split, they've broken, they're not going to come back together. Mm -hmm. uh, so this means that this condition is there for you. You yeah. know, you have to take care of it. So mm -hmm. it's like brushing your teeth. You know, you have to do it twice a day. Mm -hmm. You do have to take care of it. If you don't take care of it, uh, you know, it's unfortunately it's tough luck, but it, it is, you know, the condition is there. You must look after it. So mm -hmm. you don't get second chances. If you get out of pain and it's working, just keep doing it. Just mm -hmm. keep, keep, keep doing it because 
if it does slip out of control. And, and that's the thing, falls, accidents, all these little things can happen, but right. you'll mitigate that the stronger you are and the more exercises you are and the more you're taking care of it. Mm-hmm. Or as you know, I've had patients where they're not taking care of it, they might trip and then the bone slips very mm-hmm. Yeah, very quickly mm-hmm. out of place, and then they get all this nerve problem. Mm-hmm. Um, where I've had others where they've got a bit more resistance because, well, I've been doing my exercises, I've been doing this, and so it's often they might get derailed, but we can put them back on track quite quickly because mm-hmm. they're maintaining themselves. Mm-hmm. So I think that's probably my top tips: is definitely find uh, find the practitioner that's right for you. Uh, maybe there might be a group of practitioners where they can work together. That's mm-hmm. so key and important. If you can find someone that does chiropractic biophysics, then 100% definitely go and see them. Mm-hmm. Uh, get in touch with me if you, if you want to find, <laughs> if they don't know what to do, just get in touch with me. I'll help. Right. It doesn't matter. Yes. Um, right. Yeah, I'll tell you where to, you know, what to do and how we've done it. And, and I'll help the doctors as well. I've often done that. Right. Um, but, you know, and have a plan, have a plan that's going to follow through mm-hmm. from, you know, treatment to correction to maintenance mm-hmm. and, and know that, yes, you're going to have to maintain. You have to. It, it, it's, yeah, mm-hmm. uh, it's for the long term stability of your spine. Unfortunately, that magic cure, even if they did perform that surgery, mm-hmm. it doesn't it doesn't mean that it's going to be perfect or mm-hmm. You know, um, I mean, it might be the only thing that some people have to do. So I completely appreciate that. Like sometimes surgery is necessary. I will be quite honest. I've seen some people do so much better after the surgeries. So it's like, okay, great. That was the best thing for you. Uh, but some people are definitely trying to avoid that as long as possible. Right, right. And it may not be in the US. I mean, yeah. yeah, it may not be the option for them either. So, uh, you know, we just have to try to get as much done as we can and just try it out. Definitely, um, it's worth trying before you you commit to anything that would be permanent in that sense. Mm-hmm. Great, great. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for for your you know explanation and uh, teaching uh, about this condition and uh, what is the, about the hope and the, the possibilities. Uh, what is there anything else that you would like to mention? Uh, um, it's such a complicated condition. I can't, I can't even, um, yeah, I can't even start to explain. I mean, there's so many variations of it. There's so many different variations of it. Like if you've got, you know, your L5 fractures, your L4 fractures, you've got your congenital abnormalities that cause it. Some, you know, I've got a young, it, it doesn't, it's not just in the old, it's in the young. Um, I've got two, um, we, we take interns from a university, from Brunel University, and we've got two interns with that condition, uh, both in their 20s, who just have back pain. Or maybe, you know, I think one just had a little bit of an ache. Mm-hmm. Uh, one has it because he plays rugby and it's, uh, you know, it's a contact sport. It's a rough contact sport. So we can't tell when he broke it, but there it is. So already he's in his 20s. So we know it's there. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other gentleman actually has a congenital abnormality in it. And mm-hmm. so his has slipped. So it's just two, you know, two people, same age, mm-hmm. um, same problem, different because one might progress, the other one, because, you know, might stay stable. Mm-hmm. Uh, but both of them that are causing some problems, that they need to look after it. So, um, yeah, it's it, it's complicated. It varies. Uh, you just got to find someone that knows what they're doing. And um, yeah, I really hope that I've explained as much as I could. I yeah, this is a very, very helpful. This is really giving a lot of people the hope. I mean, a lot of people really get to get into this uh, this situation where, um, yeah, they, they, they can't find any any effective solution. So this is really help a lot of people, give them the hope. This is the most important thing. Um, I think, uh, so if I understand it correctly, uh, for the people in UK, they can perhaps give you a call, uh, visit your website, the, the health lodge. The health lodge practice.com. The health lodge practice.com. Oh, it's a bit long. <laughs> What's your telephone number? The phone number is 0208-848-8787. Uh-huh. Okay, yeah. So, um, but uh, for the people outside of uh, Europe, let's <laughs> say, they yeah. probably could get, get to the website idealspine.com. Idealspine.com, yeah. To find a specialist who, who specializes in this uh, mm. reconstructive care. Exactly, okay. yeah, absolutely. And that in, in America, it's called chiropractic biophysics. Um, mm. 
it's Don Dee Harrison and his father Don. I they just did some amazing, amazing work. Um, they're working, like I said, throughout the globe right now, um, throughout the world with uh, research on these techniques. And it's really incredible what they what they can do. And um, I'm just so yeah, I'm just so happy to be able. Uh, you know, I'm not even you know, <laughs> I'm not a master by any means. I just try really hard. Um, that those two are they're geniuses. Uh, so I'm just grateful to to have been able to learn from them and, and be able to do something. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really proud of it. So mm -hmm. amazing. Great, great, great. Yeah, thank you, thank you again for your for your time and for your thank teaching. You. And we look forward to speaking with you again. That's perfect. Thank you so much. Thank great. you. Take care. Yeah. Bye bye. Cheers. Bye.